Good morning, everybody, and uh, good morning, and welcome to our attendees from outside the hospital. Uh, this is a very important presentation that we do every year that is the review of results of microbiology and PCR labs for the year 2023. We have been doing that uh, consistently over the years, and the data that has been collected has been published partly uh, previously, and we will continue to uh, distribute this information because it relates to the uh, isolates that we have, relates to results of PCR that we are getting, and particularly related uh, to the antibiogram uh, sensitivity of the isolates that we are having in our hospital. Uh, this is a very important information for us and for the community, and that's why we have uh, tried to invite uh, uh, attendees from other parts of uh, Bahrain who are interested in, in antibiotics and infectious diseases, and uh, we would welcome their questions or comments at the end. I need to introduce Sony and uh, Surjit. Uh, Surjit. Uh, Sony is our uh, uh, assistant lab manager, and she is the senior microbiologist in our hospital, and Surjit is in charge, Surjit is in charge of uh, our PCR lab. So please go ahead and start. Thank you, Dr. Kasim. So, good morning, everybody. And we'll begin with our presentation. Uh, in the year 2023, we had total number of 9,292 cultures. You know, every year, what we do basically is that we try to see what are our most common isolates in any culture, whether it's urine or stool. And similarly, we also see our uh, sensitivity to most uh, to most common isolates, what is their sensitivity pattern. This is our first exercise. Then what we do is after we have these calculations done, we go back to our data starting from 2003 because we have been doing it since the beginning of the hospital. And then we see if we have any trend. Are our isolates increasing or decreasing in certain infections? Are we dealing with some new infections? What is our resistance pattern? Sorry. Okay. So uh, uh, we see what is our resistance pattern, basically. And uh, if we see a trend, like there is increase or decrease, then we run a chi-square statistics to see if this increase or decrease is significant. Now, why this exercise every year is so important for us or for any hospital for that matter? Now, isolates and antibiograms, if you see, it will differ from hospital to hospital. Even within a hospital, if we check one ward, ICU ward, we compare to a med surge ward, the resistance patterns and the isolates will change. <laughs> this is the reason that there has been so much, uh, you know, talk about having isolates and antibiograms, which are which are specific to each hospital and which should be used uh, by the antibiotic stewardship committee to form the antibiotic uh, prescription uh, guidelines for the hospital. And uh, gl uh, glad that CLSI M has come up with a document which is called M39, which gives a detail of how the anti isolates and antibiograms for the hospital should be uh, published or you know should be analyzed on a annual basis. So this is basically what our presentation is all about. In fact, uh, CLSM 39, they still do not uh, uh, include trend analysis, but I feel trend analysis is extremely important rather than only you know knowing what our your isolates and antibiograms are. So, We'll begin with our, with our first graph, that is our most common culture, which is important. Out of the 9,000 cultures that we have processed, urine culture is our most common uh, sample, uh, followed by vaginal swabs. We have stool cultures 13%, pharynx 9%, throat and blood culture 8%. Remaining uh, cultures like eye cultures, urethral, abscess, putrem, wound, body fluid, they all constitute 1% to 2% each. But majority of our cultures are basically urine, vaginal, stool, pharynx, throat, and blood culture. So let's see our first graph, that is urine isolates, which is the most common culture we, any microbiology lab actually sees. We had 326 isolates from 3,068 uh, 3, cultures. The most common isolate we see here is ESBL, which, uh, sorry, E. coli, which is a non-ESBL. Second isolate is E. coli ESBL. Followed by Klebsiella non-ESBL 10%, Klebsiella ESBL only 1%, Enterococcus faecalis 5%, Streptococcus B 5%, Staphs 4%, 
other isolates like candida albicans, uh, enterobacter, pseudomonas, proteus, these all constitute one to two percent uh, each. Well, of importance to note is the second most common isolate that is E. coli ESPL. Now, almost one fourth of our isolates in urine is E. coli ESPL. And what is the ESBL all about? The ESBL is actually is an enzyme which is produced by bacteria, which is called as extended spectrum beta lactamase. That is the uh, enzyme that produce that the E. coli produces. And what happens with this enzyme is that it knocks down all the cephalosporins. So it is one enzyme which is going to inactivate all your cephalosporins. Your first generation, second generation, third generation, including your fourth generation. Okay, so that's why there is so much focus on this ESBL. And we separate it out from the E. coli because if we club, then our non-E. coli ESBL will show very high resistance. So when we separate it out, we can actually see a better picture of our E. coli isolates. As uh, we mentioned that we also see what is the trend. So amongst all the isolates in urine, we have seen a trend in E. coli ESBL as it's a multidrug resistant organism. In 2003, when we started, only 1% of our isolates were E. coli ESBL positive. Gradually, we have seen in 2015, one-fourth of our isolates were E. coli ESPL. In 2020, there was a drop in the isolation of E. coli ESPL, which was significant, only 13%, which was good, of course. But over past three years, we have again seen the increase to 21%. Second most common sample is stool sample. Of course, Salmonella is our most common isolate, followed by Campylobacter, 24%. Shigella 8% and Vibrio cholera 1%. Now, over past 20 years, Salmonella has remained our most common isolate. But we were surprised in 2004 when we analyzed our data, and that's the importance of analyzing, analyzing our data, that Campylobacter was the second most common isolate. Almost one-fourth of our isolates were Campylobacter. And that's when we decided that we have to screen all the stool samples for Campylobacter. And those days, I guess, Nobody in Bahrain was actually looking for Campylobacter. Even we were surprised to see our numbers that, oh, I mean, this is like, you know, 21 fourth of isolate is like big. Those days, I think it was like almost 50% of our isolates were Campylobacter. I'll show you this trend. Like in 2003, if you see, 42% of our isolates were Campylobacter. We saw a dip to 21% in 2017. It has got, it went down to 9% in 2021. But again, it has come down, come up to 24%. So almost one fourth of our isolates are Campylobacter. Now, why is Campylobacter so important? Because the antibiotics that are used, empirically used to treat gastroenteritis are mostly quinolones and cephalosporins. And Campylobacter is naturally resistant to cephalosporins and quinolones. The drug of choice is macrolid. That's the reason that it's very important in stool we look for Campylobacter. Coming to vaginal swab cultures, 769 isolates. Candida albicans was most common, 42%. Streptococcus group B, 24%. Gardnerella, 22%. Mixed infection of candida, candida and Gardnerella, we see 9% of patient uh, samples. Staph aureus, 2%. And we had 192% of Haemophilus uh, influenza. But we did not see any uh, Neisseria gonorrhea isolates in the vaginal swab. Uh, I would like to mention that Streptococcus group B is actually not an infection in vaginal swab. But this is basically important for pregnant women because strep B is known to cause sepsis in the newborn. This basically shows their colonization. Like, you know, 24% of our samples were colonized with streptococcus group B. Coming to urethral swab, we had 27 isolates. Uh, of course, Nigeria gonorrhea was most common, 55%. Streptococcus group B, some enterococcus. E. coli, Haemophilus, and Klebsiella. Basically, these organisms we consider as colonizer in the urethra rather than infection, but we have 55% Nigeria gonorrhea mm -hmm. isolates. Coming to throat swab, we had 144 isolates. Of course, Streptococcus group A was most common, followed by Streptococcus group G and Streptococcus group C. Coming to pharynx culture, similar to what we saw in uh, the throat swab, streptococcus group A was most common, but also we also had some respiratory pathogens like 16% moraxella, 14% hemophilus, 12% klebsiella, 6% each of streptococcus group C, streptococcus group G, and streptococcus pneumonia also 6%, staph aureus 4%, and we had few isolates of MRSA as well. But in throat and pharynx, the most common is streptococcus group A. 
Coming to nasal swab, the most common was Haemophilus influenza, followed by Staph aureus 21%, MRSA 16%, Pneumococca 18%, Klebsiella 8%, Moraxella catralis 3%, other isolates were 1 to 2%. It's important to note that in nasal swab, we have seen here, see the third most common uh, isolate is MRSA, because that is where the most of the MRSAs are uh, colonizing, right? And the fourth most common is important to note the Streptococcus pneumoniae. You know, in nasal swab, 18% of our isolates are Streptococcus pneumoniae. Coming to eye cultures, it is 50%, uh, almost half of our isolates are Haemophilus influenza. Actually, second most common is Streptococcus pneumoniae. We, we saw in nasal swab, it was almost third most common uh, isolate. But in eye swab, we see a uh, lot of Streptococcus pneumoniae, followed by Staphylococcus aureus. Fortunately, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is 11%. We don't see more Pseudomonas infection here. It is mostly Haemophilus influenza and Streptococcus pneumoniae. Coming to your cultures, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, of course, is most common, followed by Staph aureus, 5% MRSA. We have Candida, 4% and Aspergillus, 6%. Strep A, 5%. Proteus, 4%. Other isolates like Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza, Proteus, they all constitute 1 to 2% of the isolates. Of importance in your swab is the percentage of fungal infections. Now, fungal infection form the third most common isolate in Year. So we see a lot of Aspergillus and Candida in, in our hospital. Coming to sputum cultures, we had 76 isolate. Pseudomonas was most common, but of course it's mostly seen in ICU patients uh, in the tracheal secretions. But in OPD patients, normally we see Haemophilus as the most common. Haemophilus and Klebsiella pneumonia as the most common. Candida species and Candida albicans, again, we mostly see in admit patients, which are ICU patients. 9% uh, Klebsiella, 7% Staph aureus, 3% MRSA, Moraxella catralis is 7%, Enterobacter 5%. See, pneumococca is only 3%. So in, in our hospital, we don't see more Streptococcus pneumonia in the sputum sample. We see Streptococcus pneumonia mostly in the eye and in the nasal swab or in the pharynx swab. But very few uh, isolates we actually see in the sputum cultures. Of importance is this organism, Stenomonas maltophilia which we mostly see in ICU patients. But what is uh, significant about this organism is that it is intrinsically resistant to all the antibiotics, including carbapenems. The only drug of choice is Bactrim. And every year we see at least two to three isolates of Stenomonas maltophilia. And another thing is that this organism is known, is known to cause outbreaks in the ICU. And if it causes outbreak, it's difficult to treat. Mortality rate with this organism is very high. Coming to wound cultures, Staph aureus is most common, 21%, followed by MRSA, 10%, Pseudomonas, 11%, 9% each of Enterococca, E. coli, E. coli ESBL was 8%, 7% of Klebsiella, 5% each of Proteus and Klebsiella ESBL. Remaining organisms like Strep A, Acinetobacter, they all were 1 to 3% mm -hmm. each. Now, if we see here, previously we have seen MRSA as the second most common isolate in the nasal cell. After that, if you see, it's only in the wound swab, it is the second most common isolate. So whenever we are dealing with the wound swab, you must remember the second most common is MRSA. Again, it's a multidrug resistant organism. If you look at the abscesses, in fact, MRSA is the most common isolate we have seen in our abscesses. Then it comes Staph aureus, Enterococca 9%, E. coli 9%, E. coli ESBL 4%, Klebsiella 7%, Proteus 4%. Other organisms like we have Streptococcus group A or, you know, some other Enterobacter, even Pseudomonas in our abscesses are, is very low. But of importance is whenever we treat wound swab and abscesses, we must remember MRSA isolates. Coming to body fluids, we had 72 isolates. Most common was E. coli. Second most common was E. coli ESBL. Previously, we saw in urine, E. coli ESBL was the second most common organism. Similarly, in body fluid also, E. coli ESBL is the second most common organism. Followed by Staph aureus 10%, Enterococca 11%, Pseudomonas 11%, Enterobacter 7%, Klebsiella 7%. Other organisms are between 1% to 2% each. But body fluid, the most important thing to remember is E. coli ESBL and secondly, the Enterococcus. 
coming to blood cultures, we had only 11 isolates, but an E. coli non-ESBL fortunately was the most common isolate because it's a very sensitive organism, followed by E. coli ESBL. Salmonella typhi is, is actually the second most common organism. We had one isolate of Enterococcus and one isolate of Klebsiella and one isolate of Staphylococcus aureus. But mostly what we see is E. coli and then Salmonella typhi in the blood cultures. Now, we'll just summarize what we have seen so that we can, you know, at least have a, when we go back, we at least have some, uh, you know, remembrance of what we have seen in our isolates. It will be useful when we treat the patients, of course. So in urine, we have seen E. coli, which is non-ESBL, followed by E. coli ESBL and Klebsiella pneumonia. So the multidrug resistant organism that most commonly we see in urine is E. coli ESBL. <clears throat> In vaginal swab, it is candid, candida and gardnerella. We must remember that we do see mixed infections of candida and gardnerella around 9% of our patients. Stool, salmonella, campylobacter and shigella. We must remember that shigella is our, uh, sorry, campylobacter is our second most common organism in stool samples. In throat, it is streptococcus group A. In ear swab, we have pseudomonas aerogenosa, staph aureus. We must remember candida and aspergillus form, third most common isolate in ear cultures. In eye swab, it is Haemophilus, Staph aureus, and Streptococcus pneumoniae. We see a lot of Streptococcus pneumoniae in the eye swabs. In sputum, it is Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, and Candida. We don't see many Streptococcus pneumoniae in the sputum sample. In wound, we must remember that MRSA is the second most common isolate. The first being Staph aureus, and then non ESB E. coli, and Pseudomonas. In abscesses, I'm sorry, I think there is a mistake here, but MRSA is the most common, and then followed by Staph aureus and non ESB E. coli. In blood, it is E. coli non-ESBL, then E. coli ESBL, and third most common is salmonella. We do see salmonella in our blood cultures. In body fluids, it is E. coli, E. coli ESBL, staph aureus, and enterococcus. If we summarize, if we see most commonly in all the cultures, even if we combine, what we see is E. coli, E. coli ESBL, Klebsiella, Klebsiella ESBL, staph aureus, MRSA, enterococcus, pseudomonas, and sometimes enterobacter, sometimes propheus. So this constitutes our most common isolates. We are not dealing with other organisms like Acinetobacter or, you know, some different Panchoya or some other alkalegions. These are most very difficult to treat organisms. Excuse me. Now we are finished with our isolates and we have, we have known what our common isolates are. Let us look at what the antibiogram looks like. This is a non-ESBL uh, E. coli. So we definitely don't expect much of cephalosporin resistance here. If we look, our non-ESBL E. coli is highly sensitive to cephalosporins and aminoglycosides, carbapenems, tazosin. The only resistance we see is augmentin, quinolones, and bacterial. So other, if you look at cephalosporin, it is almost less than 5% mm -hmm. in non-ESPL E. coli, which is very good for us, right? And of importance is the phosphomycin that we have recently added to our urine panel. We have not seen any resistance to phosphomycin. Again, it's a good drug of choice. I, I mean, we'll see in our next slide, even for MDR, it's a very good antibiotic which can be used for UTI. These are our E. coli ESBL isolate. As I mentioned before, when we say ESBL, it is going to inactivate all the cephalosporins. And I would like to, uh, you know, stress this point that uh, we have seen some reports from other laboratories where they report cephalosporin as resistant and it is ESBL negative. I mean, it's it's not a correct report actually. The cephalosporin is, it's very rare that you will have a cephalosporin resistant and it's not an ESBL. And that leads to, you know, treatment failure because the doctors keep on trying. I mean, I have my own colleague's son who's been treated for past two months for UTI. They have tried different cephalosporins and finally we realize that it is an ESBL and it cannot be treated with an, uh, with a cephalosporin. Okay? So that's the reason we don't even put cephalosporin in our E. coli ESBL graph because it is going to be 100% resistant. Uh, but ESBL being a multidrug resistant also shows resistance to quinolones. The resistance is very high. Almost half of our resistant to cephalosporin uh, the, fortunately, it remains sensitive to amikacin, uh, imipen, meropenem, atrapenem is a very good drug for E. coli ESBL and phosphomycin, as I said. Phosphomycin has shown 100% sensitivity in our setup. But bactrim, 
quinolones and augmentin, almost half of our isolates are uh, resistant. Augmentin, the latest guidelines, uh, they say that if the MIC is less than eight, we can report it as sensitive in our, uh, in our uh, uh, microbiology reports. Uh, that's why we have uh, mentioned, but previously the guidelines stated that ESBL should be reported resistant to augmentin. But now the new guidelines state if the MIC is less than eight, because it is a beta-lactamase inhibitor combination, it can be reported as sensitive. Now again, we went back and we saw what was the trend and we have seen a very good trend in resistance to gentamicin and tazosin. In 2010, our gentamicin resistance to E. coli ESBL, I mean, gentamicin is a drug of choice for ESBL. 59% was our resistance. It has come down to 18% in 2003. Similarly, tazosin resistance was 22%. It, has, it had come down to 6% in 2021. We have seen some rise in past two to three years, but this increase was not uh, statistically significant. I think 2010 was the time when we were presenting in one of our uh, annual meetings when Dr. Naja and Dr. Kasim insisted that we should restrict these antibiotics and we should make sure that uh, it's not uh, even even acting those days we did not have antibiotic stewardship committee but we restricted our antibiotics uh, in 2010 especially gentamicin amipenem and tazosin this is a clepsila pneumonia antibiogram this is again a non espl sorry i did not mention non espl but it is a non espl isolate that you are talking about similar to what we saw in non espl e coli it remains highly sensitive to cephalosporins. In fact, here our even quinolones are quite sensitive when we look up, look at the non-ESPL clepsila. Of course, uh, aminoglycosides, imipenem, meropenem, even tazosin shows good sensitivity, phosphomycin, of course. The only uh, antibiotic is nitrofurantoin and augmented for clepsila pneumonia, non-ESPL clepsila pneumonia. Now, Clepsila ESBL, similar to what we saw in E. coli ESBL, of course, cephalosporins will be 100% resistant, but the resistance to quinolone, augmentin, nitrofurantoin is very high. Even tazosin is almost 50% of our Clepsila ESBL are resistant to tazosin. Phosphomycin, fortunately, has shown very less resistance, almost 95% remain sensitive to phosphomycin. But the concern is that it has shown resistance to all class of antibiotics, unlike E. coli ESBL. We don't see resistance to, you know, meropenem or imipenem or atropenem, but Clepsila ESBL has shown resistance to all classes of antibiotics. This organism is very notorious to develop pan-drug resistance. Every year, I think we see one or two isolates where there is no antibiotic available except for polystine or, you know, we have to go for septazidim, avibactam combination. We have seen a trend again in gentamicin resistance. In 2017, our resistance to gentamicin in, e in Clepsila ESBL was 70%. It has gone down to 7% in 2003, which is very good. Again, it's a drug of choice for uh, ESBL isolates. Coming to Enterobacter. Now, Enterobacter are naturally resistant to first generation, second generation, and third generation oral cephalosporins. So, cefazolin, cefuroxime, cefixime will be resistant, but it is sensitive to ceftriaxone and ceftazidim and cefipine. Quinolones are the drug of choice. Of course, 100% sensitivity, aminoglycosides, carbapenems, atrapenem, even tazosin is good. Bacterium shows 15% resistance. The, the key characteristics of enterobacter is that it will show sensitive uh, in vitro, but when the patient is on treatment, the, the organism can develop resistance. So they show inducible resistance to cephalosporins. And that's the reason that in serious infections, uh, either quinolones or carbapenems should be reported. I mean, we, we don't even report uh, cephalosporins in enterobacter. Coming to Proteus mirabilis, uh, I'm sure we'll be surprised to see the imipenem is 100% resistant in, in Proteus mirabilis. Even I was surprised with this actually. But we looked into the guidelines and they state that Proteus mirabilis is naturally resistant to imipenem. It's not because of it has acquired resistance, but it is because of a cell wall protein, which makes it impermeable. The imipenem cannot permeate to the, uh, through the organism. And that's why either it, they say it has lower uh, sensitivity, or usually they recommend now that you don't report imipenem for proteus isolate. So this is to be considered when we are treating, uh, especially proteus infections. 
but remaining all classes of antibiotics, even first generation like cephalosporins, quinolones, carbapenems, everything remains sensitive except imipenem in protea, especially when we are dealing with a serious infection. Coming to pseudomonas, we had 45 isolates. Fortunately, our pseudomonas remains quite sensitive except ceftazidime and cefepime, but it's still 20 to 30 percent resistant is not very high. But carbapenems have remained sensitive. Aminoglycos aminoglycosides are sensitive. Even uh, tazosin is quite sensitive. Mm -hmm. Very rarely we see organisms similar to Klebsiella pneumoniae ESBL. Pseudomonas also is an organism which can develop pan drug resistance. And once it develops, it's very difficult to treat. Coming to salmonella isolates, we had 57 isolates. Fortunately, our isolates remain sensitive to quinolones and cefixime and ceftriaxone. The only resistance we have seen is ampicillin and bactrim. But very rarely we see, we do see some resistance to cephalosporin and quinolones in patients who have history of travel. So we must remember that we do see some resistance in uh, for quinolones and cephalosporins. Coming to Enterococcus fecalis, we had 43 isolates. Now in Enterococcus, there are two uh, important isolates. I mean, there are different species, but there are two species which is important. One is Enterococcus fecalis and one is Enterococcus fecium. Now, what is the difference between both of them is that Enterococcus fecalis is much more sensitive organism. If you see, it is sensitive to penicillin, augmentin, imipenem, meropenem, linezolin, except erythro and levofloxacin, it will not show any resistance. But the other spe species, which is Enterococcus fecium, fortunately, we don't see it much in our hospital. But this organism is very, very notorious. It is resistant to almost and it is known to develop even resistant to vancomycin and which we call as VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococcus fascium. It's difficult to treat, but we don't see many of these. Maybe, maybe one or two isolates in a year we, we see, but enterococcus, when we are dealing, we have to understand that two species are very important. If it's fecalis, we don't need to worry. It's easy to treat, but fascium is a difficult to treat organism. Staph aureus, we have 108 isolates. Again, in Staphylococcus aureus, we must understand that Staphylococcus aureus, there are two species. One is Staph aureus, one is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. When we say Staph aureus, it will always be sensitive to cephalosporins and augmenting. We cannot have an isolate of Staph aureus, which is not an MRSA and still shows resistance to cephalosporins. That is a wrong sensitivity. It doesn't happen like that. Just like ESBL, how that ESBL knocks off all the cephalosporins, the MRSA will knock out all the cephalosporins and augmenting. So our staph aureus, of course, it has to be resistant to augmenting cephiroxime and ceftriaxime. We have seen resistant to quinolones. Moxiflox is a better quinolone if you want to use because it's 11% resistant. Erythromycin resistance is very high. Clinda is 15%. And of course, it remains sensitive to linezolid and vancomycin. As I said, Staph aureus is a sensitive organism, but MRSA is a very resistant organism. And we can see here, of course, cephalosporins will be 100% resistant, but resistant to quinolones, erythromycin, clinda, even gentamicin is like 30%. Only drug remaining which we can, which can be used is vancomycin and linezolid. We had 16 Nigeria gonorrhea isolates. Our penicillin resistance is almost 50% in Nigeria gonorrhea. Fortunately, our isolates remain 100% sensitive to ceftriaxone. We do see resistance of almost 13% to azithromycin. And some resistance we have also seen to cefixime and uh, ciproflox. But these isolates were sensitive to ceftriaxone. Streptococcus pneumonia, again, very important isolate, especially we have seen in eye swabs, right? So penicillin resistance is 11%, a very high resistance to macrolid, almost 75%. Uh, it remains sensitive, fortunate to uh, ceftriaxone, moxiflox, linezolid, even vancomycin. We have seen 100% sensitivity. Macrolid resistance among streptococcus group A, C, and G. Now, why we monitor this is that because streptococcus group A, C, and G are always sensitive to cephalosporins and augmenting, even penicillin. We don't need to test cephalosporins for streptococcus group A. So why are we testing these erythromycin and clindamycin? So these are used mostly for patients who are allergic to penicillin. And it's important to know that even if we have a patient who is on azithromycin or clarithromycin, there is a possibility, you know, that the organism can be resistant. 
to these antibiotics because erythromycin uh, resistance is almost 30 to 40 percent and uh, flindamycin is still better sensitivity uh, but still around 15 to 20 percent of our isolates do show resistance to clindamycin. Now, candida, we have seen that candida, there are two things, candida albicans and then comes the candida species, which is, which is not, an, uh, not albicans. So, in candida species, everything is included. It is candida paracellosis, candida glabrata, candida auris, because this is the most common question that even when we tell that it is candida paracellosis, then again, the question is, is it candida albicans? No, candida albicans is one species and all other comes into candida species non-albicans. And what is the difference? Why do we differentiate? Candida albicans remains 100% sensitive to fluconazole, but fluconazole resistance in candida species is 62%. Okay? Mostly we see in candida glabrata. And of late we have started seeing, in past two years we have seen this isolate candida auris, which is resistant to fluconazole, even flucytosine, but fortunately it has remained sensitive to caspofungin. We will see our... Uh, what is our isolation of multi-resistant organism in BSH? MRSA isolation was 38%. Uh, e. coli ESBL was 38% also. Klebsiella ESBL isolation was 18%. Streptococcus uh, pneumonia resistant to penicillin is 10%. We, we didn't see any vincomycin resistant to in 2023. Carbapenem resistant in Klebsiella. As I told that Klebsiella is known to develop resistance to Carbapenem. But it remains very low at 7%. And if it... The thing is, if we uh, club all the gram-negative organisms together, so what is our resistance to carbapenem? It is just 3%. So we see very low resistance to carbapenem in our hospital, and which is a which is very good for us. Ciditoxin positivity was 12%. MRSA screening swabs, these are like basically nasal groin axilla swabs, which are done to screen the patient for MRSA. We have a positive, positivity of 8%. We don't see more, many AFB positives uh, here. We had like one positive case in uh, 13 samples. AFB stain, none were positive. Blood culture contamination rate was 1.5% in 2023. We are much below the threshold. Uh, the guidelines state less than 3% of your blood culture should be contaminated. Urine culture contamination is 9%. We still have some scope of improvement and we should improve our uh, you know urine culture collection. But it remains well below threshold of 10%. If we summarize the entire presentation, there are some key points that we have increased isolation of E. coli ESBL, which are multi drug resistant organism in urine. We have some increased isolation in Campylobacter. Our cephalosporin resistance in non-ESBL isolates remain very low, which is 5 to 6%. We should, we should be concerned about carbapenem resistance or uh, tazosin resistance in the ESBL isolate. There is decreased resistance to gentamicin in E. coli ESBL. There is in, uh, there is some increased resistance of tazosin, but it was not statistically significant. There is decreased resistance of gentamicin in Klebsiella ESBL. And carbapenem resistance in Enterobacteria, if we include all our gram negative, sorry, it's not less than 1%, it is 3% actually. So carbapenem resistance in our end, all the gram negative remains very low to 3%. Thank you very much. And uh, I will uh, hand over to Mr. Suji, who will present the PCR graphs. Thank you. Thank you very much.